All right, so quick intro here. Um, in April 2013, uh, typelevel.org showed up and spawned a huge amount of misunderstanding and confusion. So is type level, is it a collection of functional libraries? Is it a fork of Scala? Is it um, a manifestation of some underlying conflict in the community? Is it good? Is it bad? Is it in between? That's sort of what we're here to talk about. So uh, before I get to the introduction, there's um, the, the format's going to be pretty simple and pretty informal. This is not Jim Lehrer and presidential candidates by any stretch. Um, first, we're going to do, I'll do a quick introduction of everybody up here, and then we're going to hear two opening statements, one for the type level side of things and one for, uh, for type safe. And then there are a number of questions, a lot less than we have time for, really. Um, but we're going to allow some time at the end to, um, to have uh, your input. So you'll have time to ask questions if, uh, assuming these guys don't you know, run off at the mouth too much. So, um, so um, introductions. Uh, my name is Brian Clapper. I, I'm the moderator for the panel. I'm a local developer. Uh, I founded the Philly Scholar User Group. Um, and as by, by virtue of that, I've been a co-organizer of the Northeast Scholar Symposium, which we just ran for the fifth year in a row. Um, everyone else up here is a, an early Scala adopter, and each one of them has a Philadelphia connection. So to my left is Jamie Allen. Jamie is Senior Director of Global Services for TypeSafe. He's the author of Effective ACA, co-author of the upcoming Reactive Design Patterns book from Manning. Uh, Jamie and his family now live in Silicon Valley, but uh, Jamie formerly worked for Chariot and, um, and was active in the Scala community in Philadelphia very early on helped us organize Scalathon, which we ran in 2011 and 2012. Um, so there's Jamie. Um, next to Jamie is Eric Oshheim. Uh, Eric is one of the creators of Spire, a type-level Scala numeric processing library. He's also a contributor to the Scala compiler and standard library. Um, I, I kind of characterize Eric as uh, using Scala to push the limits of JVM performance. Um, and Eric currently works at Meetup, but he used to work at Azavia right here in Philadelphia. Um, all the way over there on the right is Brendan Adams, um, uh, Brendan McAdams, sorry, Brendan, I left the, I left the, he, he's, yeah, I neutered you. He's a fixture in the Scala community. Um, Brendan used to work for Tengen, uh, the MongoDB people, uh, and wrote the Casbah Scala toolkit for MongoDB. He's done training and consulting for TypeSafe, and he's worked for Netflix. Um, and he grew up in Havertown, so there's his Philadelphia connection. Uh, he also sports what I would consider probably the best developer tattoo in this room and maybe the whole conference. The caffeine molecule. Right, the caffeine <laughs> molecule, so that's pretty awesome. And then next to me is Michael Pilquist. Uh, Michael is the author of S Codec, which is a suite of open source Scala libraries for working with binary data. Uh, S Codec relies heavily on Shapeless and provides integrations with other type level libraries. Um, Michael's also an early adopter of Scala. He works for CCAD and they've been using um, They've been using Scala for a very long time up there. Um, Michael is the chief software architect at CCAD, um, which stands for Combined Conditional Access Development. It's a joint venture between Comcast and Aris. Um, he's responsible for the design and development of control systems that manage tens of millions of cable system devices, including set-top boxes and head-end equipment. And so uh, by virtue of that kind of work, he's been uh, very active in the Scala community. So we're going to start out, now that you know who everybody is, we're going to start out with a couple of opening statements. Um, Eric is probably best qualified to represent the type level position, so he's going to do the opening statement for them. Great. All right, so can everyone hear me? Fine? Yeah? All right, so um, as Brian alluded to, there's a little bit of confusion about type level. Um, when type level started, it was sort of an umbrella organization for a bunch of Scala libraries that sort of shared a certain point of view, say, in terms of type functional programming. Um, after that point, I'd say the vision has kind of expanded. At this point, type level is, what I'd say type level is dedicated to is supporting a community of people doing functional programming in Scala. And so that does involve library support, but it also involves like growing the community, um, like blog posts, like educational material, pedagogy, tutorials. Um, also trying to like identify strategies for doing functional programming in Scala. So um, as Brian sort of alluded to, like a lot of us are kind of pushing the limits of what you can do in terms of expressiveness or re you know, reusable design, safety, such, so things like that. Uh, type level really wants to support people doing that and try and kind of help them collaborate. In other words, um, rather than everyone kind of going off in their own direction, try and sort of like find common paths we can share. Uh, 
So really, when you phrase it like that, what I would say typable is about is trying to sort of co-evolve the language in the community around Scala. In other words, um, sort of find this direction of type functional programming and see you know, how far can we push this and sort of what idioms or patterns are we, do we need to do that and what do we need from the language to do that in terms of like, you know, are there language features that help us here? Are there language features that hurt us here? And so on. So that's, that's the goal, a community sort of finding the best ways to do what we, what we do together. Um, and type level as an organization basically wants to support this vision. Uh, so there's like a bunch of ways we can support that vision, right? There's the libraries Brian alluded to. Um, there's potentially like compiler plugins, like uh, for example, um, Michael Pilquist's Simulacrum is this attempt to create a syntax for type classes. Type classes are this important thing that's exploded in usage, but it's sort of this encoding you have to learn to recognize. It can be very hard to see what's going on. Um, there's this idea that from type level's point of view, we'd like to have first class type type class support in the language. And that's something that we can potentially do via macro annotations, compiler plugins, what have you. Um, but ultimately, for the kinds of work we might want to be doing, the nice thing about a compiler fork is that in theory, if you're willing to put the work in, we can, we can evolve the language in whatever direction we want, sort of as a community together, and allow people to sort of vote with their feet, in other words, or, or vote with their compiler flags maybe, right? So we provide these ideas or these features, see which ones take off, see which ones don't. Um, you know, people who were involved in type level from the beginning are kind of, again, on the sort of edge of what's possible. We're experimentalists, and I think fundamentally we believe that experimentation and diversity in the language is a good thing. In other words, uh, the language, the state of the art progresses when people kind of push the limits and try new things. And so uh, type level as, as a community is basically just about that. That's, that's what we want to do, and all the projects involved kind of share this philosophy about evolving typed functional programming at Scala, basically. So. Right, and now as a response from the type safe side of things, there really is only one candidate to deal with that, and that's Jamie. <laughs> okay. Um, one of the things about type safe that I think is important to understand is just the history of where we came from. And I'm going to real quickly talk about that. Type safe was a company that literally was created by a VC. I mean, Greylock had a vision of what they thought enterprise programming could be in the future. And Back in the days when we were using Scala in 2009 at CCAD, things were a little rough. Um, when you wanted to upgrade from 275 uh, to 276 or 277, it got ugly. And when you went to 28, I think Mike lost about two weeks of his life trying to make that upgrade. And uh, that wasn't fun for anybody. So in order to sort of figure out how to make things work in the in enterprise environment, TypeSafe had to figure out how to stop this mess from happening to people. And that meant that things had to be codified, things had to be turned into processes that didn't exist before. And that has rubbed certain people in the community the wrong way, as they've wanted to express themselves through a language which is scalable enough for them to do amazing things, but at the same time, uh, they can't necessarily be allowed into an enterprise distribution that has to be 100% stable, 100% productized, and 100% ready for the enterprise, right? So um, generally speaking, there is nobody in TypeSafe that says, boy, what's happening in type level or what's happening with the compiler fork is a bad thing. At the same time, we have to think about what we have to do to make large companies like Apple, like GE, like Goldman Sachs, comfortable and successful with the technologies. And that sort of drives our basis. While at the same time, hopefully, you know, we're all working together as a community. And, and the, one of the biggest things for us was that when the compiler fork was announced, and mind you, there were already 750 compiler forks at the time. This is a normal dynamic in the open source world. Um, the, the really exciting thing for us was the announcement that merge compatibility with the compiler would be included. And that meant that whatever Miles and, and Eric and, and Michael came up with would, when it was you know, brought into the actual compiler of type level, would also be something that could be pulled into the type safe compiler when productized. And that you know, was a huge announcement for us. Because if it had been what they call a hostile fork, I think that uh, you know, we would have been really bummed out because it means that people like Miles and Michael and, and Eric and everybody else who contributes to these amazing libraries would have been going in their own direction and not working with us at the same time. So. Okay, that's fair. 
So we're going to start with a uh, <clears throat> bunch of questions. Mostly they're intended to stimulate conversation up here and some thinking out there. Um, generally, I'll point to one or two people to start it, but the, the idea is that everybody up here will get a chance to weigh in on a particular question. I think we've already more or less addressed the first one on the list, which was, uh, does type level represent some kind of schism in the Scala community between the more enterprise-friendly type safe camp and the functional programmers in the, the type level camp? Um, this is something that has come up on a fair number of mailing lists. So even though we've already sort of talked about this, there's a, there's a side uh, conversation there. Is this emblematic? Never mind what the people up here say. Is there any sense that this is emblematic of any kind of an undercurrent of tension between two competing factions? So I think we could start with Eric and then just go around the table on that one. So, yeah, I mean, I guess as far as competing factions, right, I, I would say no. I guess, you know, the thing that I would say, right, is that there's different constituencies, right? And type, I mean, I think um, Jamie did a great job of explaining sort of that, like, you know, when you're trying to target someone like Apple or GE, you know, that, if that's sort of a constituency you want to target, you know, there's certain guarantees they need, there's certain things that make them comfortable, there's certain things they want or don't want, right? And, you know, I think that part of what I think can make, can make something like this successful is the fact that, you know, there are different constituencies and we can, you know, ideally with one language, we can serve them differently, right? So. Uh, for people who do want to push the envelope or our, or our grad students doing research, you know, we can give them a way to do that that's compatible, you know, at, at some level compatible with what people in industry want to do or people in the enterprise want to do while still kind of acknowledging that like, uh, you know, ACA is great for building these huge enterprise systems. Um, it's less good for certain kinds of type directed fun functional programming, say. Um, we don't have to, there doesn't have to be like a one size fits all solution basically. So, so I mean, I would say no, but I do think it's worth acknowledging these constituencies that have maybe different needs or desires. So how about from one of you guys who are quiet over here? Um, you know, I think one of the things as well is, is we can't go with just what's in the standard library. I mean, at some point you're going to, uh, I think Brian is, is subtly hinting that I need to be closer to the microphone. Um, we, we can't, you know, there, we're going to have to go beyond the standard library at some point. And one of the things that I've found with type level is that it means, you know, there's a lot of libraries that are there, but there are also, um, you know, there's all of these libraries for doing things that maybe I need to do beyond what's in the standard library, but they're working together. So they are, you know, HList is a great example. I've seen HList implementations in six different libraries in Scala. Um, there's a lot of libraries that are starting to move to shapeless as HList implementation. And so there's a bunch of them in, in the type level library that use shapeless because, hey, we're all part of the same package of utilities and libraries. Um, having people working together to build improvements on Scala, not just the compiler, but the libraries and other things that we're going to use beyond that is really beneficial because they are working together. It's not just a collection of random things, but there's people with similar ideas that are building things together. I think Spire plugs into a couple of other pieces, and Eric has an algebra plug-in. Um, I mean, there's other useful things. Uh, what is it? Uh, there's a compiler plug-in, and I'm trying to remember what it is, the, the horrible type annotation for... Uh, for one of the pieces, yeah, kind projection is like right there is something where, hey, you might need to do kind projection in Scala, but the way that you express it is absolutely horrific. And so there's a compiler plugin that improves upon that. And I think those improvements are something that we all can benefit from, whether it's coming from the enterprise side or the more functional side. Yeah, just to kind of echo the comments um, so far, uh, you know, I wouldn't describe it as any type of, um, you know, factions in the community, but I do think there's tension. And I think that tension is really healthy. Um, you know, I think uh, we're seeing a lot of adoption in functional programming in like mainstream libraries. I mean, Akka obviously uh, has uh, certain parts of it that are very influenced by a lot of things from uh, more traditional uh, functional styles. Uh, at the same time, you know, a lot of the type level libraries are influenced by uh, many different um, other communities. Uh, Haskell community comes to mind, the Idris community comes to mind. Um, but at the same time, like, you know, well, Scala might have some unique ways to uh, encode certain things or, or, or the, 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 the various language features and the abilities to plug in, um, whether it be macro annotations or compiler plugins, let us do things different, you know, differently in Scala uh, than maybe we would in one of those other communities. Um, so anyway, I think it's a very healthy tension that uh, folks that are kind of interested in pushing the bounds on what's possible can do so. Um, and maybe more conservative libraries that, that maybe can't be doing that for, for enterprise support reasons or whatever, um, have an appropriate mechanism where they can pick up that functionality uh, at the appropriate time. Um, in the initial, like, early days of Scala, we've talked before about, like, different parts of the standard library that um, 
maybe isn't uh, fully fleshed out. Um, and, and those things got in like just directly, right? Um, you know, Martin's talked before about uh, various subsystems that um, someone just started writing and it got committed and now it's part of the standard library and there's no undoing that in a sense, um, at least without some deprecation cycles. And so I think we're actually at a really interesting point where like Scala's matured, uh, the community's matured to a point where those things aren't getting in anymore. Um, they're kind of going through this incubator phase. And like overall, I think you know, what we're doing with a lot of the type level projects is that it's, um, a bit of an incubator for language features, or it's like language infrastructure as opposed to like distributed system infrastructure that Akka provides or, or uh, other infrastructure that um, maybe we provide for database access, et cetera. So, uh, yes, go ahead. Jamie, you got any follow up? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, the interesting thing to me is that these constituencies exist because Scala lets people do things they can't in other languages. And that has pluses and minuses. Primarily on the plus side, people are building incredible stuff. And it's, it's not just the people sitting here at this table and the, the kinds of libraries like Shapeless or uh, you know, Spire or Skodak, which are incredible. Um, but look at Spark, look at Kafka. People are expressing themselves in ways that they can't with other languages. And yeah, sometimes they run into sharp edges or they run into things that you know don't quite work the way they hoped and they have to hack around it. But they can, and they're successful only because the language is scalable. And by that I mean the language is not putting rules in place that say that you can't express your imagination in code. Um, so that also means that you have a lot of freedom of thought. And people can go out and do these things and express themselves in a lot of different ways. And not all of them are things that everybody may agree with or, or um, can be pulled into larger libraries, whether it's Scala, the language, or you know, a, a type level library even. But that doesn't mean they don't have value. And those voices, I think, need to be heard because otherwise innovation is stifled. And that can't happen, right? This is a really amazing time for both functional programming, distributed systems, and they're not, you know, diametrically opposed to each other. They're actually very relevant to each other. And we're all kind of figuring this out on the fly. So. All right, so I'm gonna skip the second question on this list since I think we touched it. Um, but um, Michael alluded to this, and I've heard people out in, on the net refer to type level as kind of an R&D lab for, for Scala. Um, Michael referred to it as an incubator. Um, so what does that really mean? And I'd like to start, I think, with Jamie, get the type safe perspective on this. That's okay, we feel like we're the R&D lab for Oracle. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that's certainly true. There are parts of things that are happening inside of the type level libraries that really are influencing the direction of the language. Um, Michael talked about type classes. The encoding of type classes, you have to know the pattern you're looking for in a class to understand that this is a type class. <clears throat> I think that's something that definitely needs to be encoded through types themselves to express that this is a type class type or a type class instance or um, at the same time, you know, we may not include everything that comes from Spire. There has to be a community discussion about, not Spire, sorry, type level. Um, there has to be a community discussion about what we can and can't do. And there are certainly going to be rules. Like we all love the work of Miles Sabin on uh, Shapeless, but the macros that he's using and, and that the library is using, uh, the compiler team has, you know, concerns about in the enterprise. There's a difference between the concepts of black box macros and white box macros. And this whole area of white box macros, you know, we don't really want to go there in an enterprise platform. So can you explain those terms? Not, people? not deeply. <laughs> well, just, just differentiate. Yeah, right? sure. Black box macros, I mean, think about the terms in testing. You know about black box testing versus white box testing. There's a difference between inputs and outputs versus knowing what's inside the, the spaghetti maker, right? Um, and that, that view into the spaghetti maker is what really makes a compiler team nervous. The access to stuff inside this meta programming level where at compile time, you're generating code, right? Um, I don't know if I explained that well enough. What do you guys think? I don't want to go too far off tangent though. No, yeah, I, I would just add to that. Like if, if you can live within the confines of black box max, macros, there are certain guarantees about what you can do or what, what the macro author is limited to do inside that implementation. And so anyway, if you have black box max, uh, macros, uh, ID support tends to work better. Um, you know, white box macros are a little bit harder to get working in an IDE that the, the, 
you know, the, the team that's building the IDE actually has to execute your code and, and reflect over the, the generated. What could um, possibly so, go wrong? Yeah, yeah it was hard um, enough to do the IDE, really. <laughs> so, and so just for clarification, yeah. um, where the compiler team's concern over the macros being used by Shapeless are that they are... White box right. macros, yeah. Right. And, and that's fine. I mean, the, the ability to do that is, is fantastic. It's just that, and we will let certain parts of it in. You saw this with a, a tool called Quasi Quotes, right? Mm -hmm. um, but that's like an exception where we're saying, yeah, you're right. That's a really good thing. We'll find a way to support it without opening up the can of worms. Uh, so yeah, I, I think that the R&D aspect is true. Um, at the same time, we, we have rules that we have to stay within. And they, I think that the community knows this. And while sometimes it can be frustrating, there's a certain level of appreciation that, hey, we're just not going to unleash Scala 212 and, you know, make something that could be potentially unstable for people. So, Okay, anybody else? Brendan, you have anything to add? No, I mean, I think, sorry. <laughs> I mean, I think, I think that's been covered fairly well. Um, obviously, it is important that things make sense and things work. I mean, IDEs alone are something that a lot of people use, whether they use it as a crutch or something that's, you know, really useful. I know... Um, as a Scala developer, I've used IntelliJ for a number of years, and IntelliJ has been a long uphill battle to get to the point where it's everything works in Scala. And, and certainly while, you know, I, I, I'm a fan of Shapeless and all those other things, but I also see the value in, hey, these things should work in an IDE. If I'm writing code, one of my concerns is can I go on vacation and not have my coworkers plotting to kill me when I come back? Um, this means that if I write something, it needs to be something they can work with, they can understand, um, they can bring up in their IDEs and other things. And so on, on, you know, on one hand, I see a lot of value in, in what type level is doing, but I also can see the concerns with, are these things going to work? Are they going to make sense to people? Are they going to work in our tools that we're used to using? Because the worst possible thing, and I've had this happen in IDEs before, is your IDE gives you a false error. It tells you that something is wrong. And then you go looking for documentation. You waste an hour trying to fix something that's not actually an error. Or the other side of it, which is it doesn't tell you that it's an error because it just gives up on looking at what you're looking at. And these are things that um, we definitely should be concerned about because it, it brings in the adoption and makes sure that other people are able to use these tools. And so we sort of have to look at both sides of things, but we have to have that concern. So Eric, as I know, you're never at a loss for words. Yeah, so one interesting thing to add, I mean, so I think the characterization of R&D is a little interesting because... Um, so, for example, four years ago, who could have predicted? And people in the enterprise literally are using Shapeless. I mean, like, that's just a fact, right? I mean, it's, it's definitely happening. And who would have predicted four years ago that dependent typing would, would make it into the enterprise? I mean, no, I don't think I would have taken that bet. I don't think anyone would have. Um, so I think it's interesting in that I think there's some truth that maybe there's some R&D going on in terms of the library design, but the stuff is being used. I mean, not everywhere, you know, not... But, but being used enough that, you know, there's real support requests, there's pull requests coming in. Um, so, you know, in terms of the design of Shapeless or, or Spire, which we're using at Meetup, or, or, all the, or a lot of these libraries, like, you know, S Codec especially, I mean, I know that they're getting very heavy use from certain places that maybe have looked at the sort of risk-reward trade-off and decided that, that, you know, that it was worth it to be a little more on the bleeding edge to get this thing they wanted. So I think R&D is maybe somewhat correct, but it's also true that it's, it's not just academic. I mean, it's literally being used in production, so. So I think Eric must have planned that because that's a nice segue into the next question, which is, um, which address, uh, I'd like to address the two demand sides here, right? I mean, um, and I don't know if we can actually quantify it, but there, we're talking about two different kinds of demand. There's the enterprise demand, um, and we have an idea of what that means. And then there's demand for some of these more bleeding edge, edge features, as, as Eric puts them. So I, I'd like the panel to address um, perceptions of the demand for both and then how we might uh, where tensions might exist between the demands for those features. Um, so I think this one, I'd like to actually start with um, Brendan on this one. Okay. Um, I'm certainly probably sitting in the middle. Uh, the bleeding edge stuff makes my head hurt. This is why among I other, to start with you. Is, yeah, it's among <laughs> other, you know, another part of the problem. So I see value in the bleeding edge and I try to keep track of the bleeding edge, but at the same time I, I do you know, I have come to this point as a developer of, of keeping this concern of whether my colleagues can understand what I've done. So it's not always valuable for me to grab the bleeding edge and use that. But at the same time, um, I'm going to be severely limited if I stick to just what the tools are that are in front of me, if I'm not looking at all of this stuff that's outside. And so for me, I'm looking for that, that 
sweet spot where the bleeding edge becomes something that's not quite bleeding edge, but it's still more advanced and understandable. And I think a lot of that is coming from type level. And whether that trickles down into Scala, I mean, this is a, a big part of the, the compiler fork is this idea that they want to be able to merge, they want to be able to combine things. That we, you know, having this R&D lab means that eventually people like me can have something that's maybe fresh out of research and really into, you know, productized, but maybe hasn't made it into the mainstream yet. But it's enough that there's documentation, there's tools, there's uh, comments and, and all these other things that I can make sure that I can implement something, but also make sure that the people around me are able to use that. I think between the two, the two teams, because I mean, you have R&D happening in ACA as well. They just released, what is it, ACA typed? which still looks like it's a little experimental, but they're using macros and other things to sort of do typed actors. So you have both sides of me. And ACA has lots of experimental modules, and it's the same sort of decision tree, which is, am I ready to take the leap into this? Are people going to be able to understand this, or is this still something that's a little too bleeding edge? And so, you know, we kind of have to consider this, but it's going to come from both sides of the product. There's always going to be research on both teams. So I'd like uh, Michael to chime in next now. Um, uh, I, I'd like to point out, CCAT is kind of a bleeding edge shop. You guys have been for a long time. So um, if you can kind of try to zoom out a little bit from your day-to-day -day stuff. Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, so like we, we build uh, mission critical systems, um, you know, control systems. Uh, so like while we're talking about bleeding edge, we're talking about things like language features. We're talking about um, things like path dependent types, um, you know, things that, that uh, are completely reliable and stable to be building on, right? So I don't want to give the impression that like uh, these things are are flaky in any sense, right? Um, but rather like they don't have a groundswell of, of community support around them with all of the tutorials and blog articles and 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 documentation and books and and, and whatnot, right? Um, so so yeah, I, you know I kind of want to give a little background on like why we got involved. Like I I've been doing functional programming for a while, but um, I also did like Spring and JPA and Hibernate and, and kind of like your normal enterprise software stack in, in the mid 2000s. Um, and, and while I had interest in functional programming before, um, you know, like what really hooked me into Scala was the original actors library, like pre ACA, and the collections library. Um, and it's funny because like now these days, like I'm less enthralled with, with, with some of those designs. I'm much more interested in, in things like Scala Z Stream, which takes typing to a very strict level. Um, but at the same time, uh, we had like this very gradual adoption of functional programming. Um, and so while we got you know, initially in invested into uh, Scala for those two areas, the, 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 initial, um, the initial actors and, and the collections library, um, you know, I think it was 2011, the day of Scalathon actually, um, held here in the city. Uh, when I was kind of sulking that I wasn't able to make it. And so I took some time that Saturday afternoon and watched a brilliant talk by Nick Partridge um, on like monoids and semigroups. Um, and at the time he like derived the definition of a monoid and semigroup. And I just thought like, wow, that's really amazing. Uh, just something about that just hooked me into functional programming. Um, and it wasn't long after that that we uh, started looking at Scala Z7 for, um, you know, so for really like error accumulation with validation. I think you're going to hear more about that in the next session from from Brendan. Um, and like silly things like uh, syntax enrichments around like working with options, like you know, hey, this is much more convenient. It has nothing to do with like getting my overall job done. It's just uh, a little more convenient to write code this way. And like once we got hooked into that, you know, we just started, you know, kept our continuing pulling the functional thread, um, and eventually where we are today, we're using Scala Z Stream heavily in, like I said, mission critical systems, um, and like we're very pleased with the results from it. I mean, there's definitely a learning curve. Um, we we're trying to, you know, participate in the writing of those blog articles, the the building of the community, um, but yeah, like I I want to make sure the takeaway is not that like this this cutting edge stuff is in any way uh, unreliable. Now, uh, Jamie, you're well versed to speak, I think, for the enterprise side, since, uh, among other things, you direct the consulting efforts at TypeSafe. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that, uh, interestingly to me, there have never been so many demands on developers as there are now to understand different concepts that we really didn't have to think about before. And this isn't just functional programming, it has to do with concurrency understanding asynchrony and non-blocking, understanding distribution 
and, and the levels of thread safety that we never had to deal with before. Um, and, you know, whenever I was at CCAD, that's where I started using Scala, Mike said, you're going to, and we all said, okay. And I was lucky enough to be sitting with Bev, you know, pair programming all the time, trying to figure out exactly what's going on. I was able to walk this path, right? But a lot of developers, this all gets thrown in their faces. And it's, it's difficult and hard for developers to make so many paradigm shifts at the same time. Um, it has to be supported by the community. And the really great thing is when you see everybody say, you know what, I've got to be a good citizen. I've got to be out there with my organization, supporting the groups and, and, and approaches that uh, we believe in. And you know, if that doesn't happen, because there's no way TypeSafe is going to be able to do it by themselves. So. You're up. Yeah, so I, I pretty much agree with what people have said. I think there's an interesting thing, though, which is, right, in terms of advocacy for the language, you know, just what Jamie's talking about, I think there's sort of two sides of that. There's one which is, you know, Java programmers in the enterprise kind of pulling them forward to, to use Scala and learn these new concepts and deal with this new complexity and, and sort of exciting possibilities it opens up, right? That's definitely one. But in some ways, I actually see type level not so much as competing for that crowd of hearts and minds, but rather against folks who are looking at using Python or Julia or Rust or, or Haskell or Idris or something. And so there's a sense in which, you know, like sort of what Michael says, you know, these things aren't bleeding edge because they're unstable and broken, but just because maybe they're complex or they're a little bit hard to learn. But, but I think that the complexity is worth it when you're trying to like, for, for just to give an example, someone coming from a dynamic world, abstracting over arity is easy for them. They do it all the time. They're used to doing it. The idea that a language would make it hard to do that is, seems strange to them or crazy and they would, wouldn't want to use it. Something like shapeless or, or shapeless or other things gives them a way to do that. And so similarly with Spire, you know, in Python, treating things like numbers as if they're numbers and just using the same syntax for all of them. It's like an easy thing, you do it all the time. You know, in the sort of Java or the traditional scholar world, it's a lot harder and there's a lot of caveats there. Spire was intended basically to solve that problem or similar kinds of problems. And so I do think that there's, I think we need to try and make things easier for developers. And I think we want there to be a narrative of like, this is how we think you should write code. Here's how it works, here's why, here's what you should do. And I, and I think that the community is probably the best placed group to do that in terms of the, the blog articles, the tutorials, the support, the you know Gitter or IRC channels, Twitter, you know what have you. So, so I mean, I guess we're in violent agreement, but I just think that's a unique take on it. Maybe that we're not just competing with Java or the sort of enterprise developers; we're competing with you know all these different languages and all all the paradigms that they're bringing to the table. Okay, so it sounds like a big love in up here, right? <laughs> so, so this one starts with Jamie, but I mean, are you really saying that TypeSafe's not at all concerned about this? There's no concern within type safe that type level is going to be disruptive force. No, no, honestly. Um, I, I think that most of the people involved in the type level effort and the people at type safe know each other extremely well and talk a lot about what's going on. Uh, when it, you know, the fork happened first, we saw the precursors of it when miles was off in, in Norway and talking about it with John pretty and, and, uh, uh, you know, there was, there was some shots across the bow. And then when it happened, yeah, you know, we, the email went out inside the company. Everybody went, oh, no. What's, you know, what does this mean? We got one ping from a customer, one, saying, what is this? What's going on here? And that was actually from Dustin Whitney, who, uh, Pellucid Analytics, who was actually pretty tapped into the community as well, was the founder of the New York Scala meeting and stuff like that. So, um, the, the general response when we, when, we, when we looked at our constituency in the enterprise world was, we have no idea what, you, what just happened, but it probably doesn't affect us. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and that sort of made us all kind of go, okay, well, yeah. And, and we had to think about who we are. We are collaborators on open source. TypeSafe may own Akka and may own Play and may own the compiler code for Scala, not the language itself, right? Um, but at the same time, you know, we aren't people trying to go off and do anything on our own. And we will never make those components different for pay than what people, you know, get for free. That is in, ingrained in our company, right? So as open source developers, we had to look at what open source meant. And open source means that you have people with divergent views who are going to fork and do different things. And we had to realize that that's a healthy dynamic, not a negative thing, so. 
Does anyone, anyone have anything to add to that? I'll just say one funny piece of trivia, which is I think the first person outside of type level to submit either a PR or maybe a, you know, submit issues on the type level fork was at Jason Zog, who works at type, type safe. So, I mean, I think that pretty much, you know, kind of paints a picture of it. Um, so a, a follow on question then is that, um, well, these, we, we've sort of touched on this, but um, what's, there, there's this notion that some things that are being done in type level will make their way into the, uh, the official type safe supported products. Is there any, have there been any discussions within the community or within type level and type safe about how that will happen? Is there a plan for that to happen or is this sort of just an ad hoc, yeah, you know, it should happen and we'll deal with it when it does? I mean, I think my assumption had been that, you know, if there was interest, then, you know, there might be a SIP. It would probably follow the normal process, just that, you know, you may be to get a signal, oh, hey, that thing you did, it looks interesting, let's try and make it happen. And, you know, I, I didn't get the sense that there was any special process, just that, you know, it's not always nice to get assurances before going through a big bureaucratic process that, that you know, there's interest. I mean, anyone who's tried to go write a SIP knows that it's a, it's a time-consuming process, and if you have no idea if it's going to be accepted, it's kind of demoralizing to work on. So that, that's just my sense, is that it... it it's just a way of vetting the feature first and figuring out, well, yeah, we, we like the way that that's been working, so we're interested, basically. So, yeah, can I? Um, let's face it, the SIP process sucks. It does. <laughs> it's, it's not fun, but then again, JCP isn't either. At the, at, we tried investing in this by having Dick Wall work on the SIP process and community process because we realized from feedback from various people that trying to get involved with Scala was way too hard. And so, you know, we figured that we had to invest in this in some way, shape, or form. So we contracted Dick to work on this for a while. But that doesn't mean that this is solved either. It is going to be painful to go through the SIP process. That said, there aren't people sitting waiting in, in, in you know, uh, like a trap for, uh, you know, these things to come in and then just rip them apart or anything like that. Hopefully that never happens because it should have already been discussed between all the stakeholders that, hey, this is something I want to do. What do you think? And hopefully, you know, if it's a really great idea and something like the encoding of type classes, which I'm, I'm all for, uh, but I'm not a compiler developer, so. No. So as a developer of a, a, a rather useful API, what do you think about this? Yeah, so I guess there's a couple of things I wanted to say. One is that, like, I don't think we've been What's clear it? today exactly as, like, what, what the artifacts of the Scala C4 are. Um, I mean, we've alluded to it a little bit, but basically, um, like, in the grand scheme of forks, there's, like, you know, I fork a project on GitHub and it's just my own project and I issue PRs against. And then there's like full on like destructive or aggressive fork. I forget the, the phrase someone used. Um, and like this is definitely closer to, to the, the, the first uh, example I gave. Um, all, like if you, if you were to use the, the um, type level Scala C fork, um, the bytecode generated is completely compatible with Scala C, with the official Scala C. So like if that wasn't true, I think we would be, uh, you know, I think Jamie's answer, for instance, would be a lot different. And I think library authors like myself would be uh, much more hesitant about, you know, possibly ever using um, the type level compiler. Um, but, but since everything's completely compatible, it becomes a local decision, right? Each team can choose like whether or not that, you know, that, that particular team would benefit from using the features of the type level compiler. Um, and library art authors aren't forced to make a decision on behalf of like all of their users, right? Or, or like bifurcating the community into like two groups of binaries. Um, so one, I think that that's a really important part about the type level fork is that um, it's just syntax stuff that um, after compilation time, the artifacts are completely compatible with the entire ecosystem. Um, and the other part too is that I just think that um, like we're already starting to see um, some, I mean, maybe, maybe this is, is not fair, but like there are certain things that are very important in the, in the type level libraries that are already going through the SIP process or already being incorporated into the language. I mean, certainly Miles' work throughout the years has influenced a lot of uh, language features. Um, the one that comes to mind currently, it's used both in shapeless uh, via macros as well as part of the type level um, issue list uh, you know, for the type level compiler is uh, singleton types. Uh, I think it's SIP 23. Um, you know, hopefully it makes Scala 2.12, um, we'll see. Um, so anyway, and I think that's going to continue, knowing all the folks involved, um, you know, I, I would expect merge compatibility to be maintained between Scala C and type level C, um, and I'd expect uh, that, that binary guarantee to always be uh, in place. And, and that's a very strong guarantee as well, right? 
Um, Eric had, had alluded to this earlier. Um, it's not even just the binary compatibility, but we actually have a, another constraint in place, and that's anything that would change source compatibility is behind compiler flags. Um, so like you can't act, like if you're using type level C, you can't accidentally start using type level features and kind of lock you into the type level compiler, right? You get to completely opt in into every uh, individual feature. Um, right, so my timer says that this is a good time to uh, take a break from the canned questions I have up here and open it up to, to you guys. We, um, so there's a, there's a microphone floating around here someplace. Please be sure to use the mic when asking your questions so that they end up uh, being recorded. So hang on for a sec, we'll get started. Um, Josh is already up, if you, you can go ahead. And then Joe, you, you be next, please. Um, I just wanted to try and bring out, because I mean, I really appreciate that everyone has been talking about everyone being on the same page. So I want to just p push back against that for a minute and talk about like perception, right? So um, I've had conversations, you know, I've been a Scala developer for full time for a lot of years. and. When, uh, say, TypeSafe, for example, first started, I thought that TypeSafe's role in the community was going to be sort of uh, commercial support and stability for Scala, right? Um, but then my perception, not knowing the details, right, is like the word Scala has been removed from like the top half of the TypeSafe web page, right? Or like the TypeSafe people talking here, except for this top, like they don't have Scala in the, in, in the um, in their presentations, right, descriptions, right? There's a sense that like Java enterprise has been prioritized over Scala enterprise, right? From that world, you know, which, you know, and that I think also like who's on the leadership and things le like leadership has said, all kind of contributes to the sense like the world, I'm like I'm a Scala developer, I'm like, oh, it's not clear that TypeSafe is actually who owns sort of like the Scala world is like, has my interests at heart, right? And so it's exciting then when there's community support where like the community is like, they're like, oh, actually like what's the state of the open source world and, and are we working together to pr like push the things that we want? Um, and so like I feel like there is that sort of sense of schism where it feels like, you know, maybe there are different parts of the community moving in different directions. Okay, so let's get some feedback on that, on that question. Everybody um, clear on what Josh is asking? Somebody wanna jump in? Jamie, since you have, uh, that's probably directed most at, at type C. Yeah, no, I, I think that's fair. Um, you know, we are trying to help b people build reactive systems, right? And by that, you know, it sounds like architecture. I always said that whenever it first came out, but at the same time, it has, you know, very meaningful um, concepts behind it with the, you know, elasticity and, and resilience leading to responsiveness. The implementation behind it is, irrelevant to us. And while we are obviously massive Scala fans, there are people out there struggling to build reactive systems with Java. And Play has always supported both, you know, Java and Scala. Akka has always supported Java and Scala. And interestingly, from the TypeSafe customer base, I would say that Java's usage with those libraries exceeds Scala's. Uh, because if you look at, you know, Marriott or GE, they're going to say, look, I've got all these things I need my people to be able to do. I don't want to also try and make them learn a language. Even if there are tangible benefits involved, they don't want their people to have to learn all of these things at the same time. Uh, yes, I think that you will see TypeSafe talking more about Java, you know, but that doesn't mean that, A, we don't love Scala, B, we're de-emphasizing it or not investing in it anymore. It's just that we want the message to go out beyond just a limited group of people who are in a single community. You know, we don't even want reactive to just be about type safe. We want go to be reactive. We want node to be reactive. We want, you know, closure and, and, and any other platform you can think of to be reactive. Right. And, and it's great how the community has responded to that. Um, but yeah, Scala is just one component in it. Anybody else want to weigh in? Yeah, but I, I think as well, there, there's at least, I've seen a lot of a halo effect. Um, you know, Apple for a long time sold Macs because people bought iPods and found out that the Mac was kind of cool too. Um, I've seen that a lot, especially Spark is a great example right now where people are, you know, Java programmers are coming to Spark and then they're looking at all this stuff and they're looking at the examples in Java, they're looking at the examples in Scala and they start to go, this Scala thing looks kind of cool and, and head over on that side. And, you know, I think that, 
you don't necessarily have to push the language. The language will sell itself. If you have tools and people understand that these tools are written in Scala and they really like working with these tools, they see examples in Scala and they look at them versus Java, you, you have this momentum that already is there that people will start to consider this if there's someone who's willing to consider this to begin with. And so, you know, the ecosystem continues to grow. You bring people in from all different areas. They improve the product and hopefully they look at, you know, they look at the things that we want them to look at down the road. Um, I think the next uh, person who had his hand up was Joe Lynch in the back. How you doing, guys? Thanks for coming out. Um, question only, it's not directly relevant to the talk, but just because we have so many representatives, um, just an outside opinion is when we when we at lead id entered the scala community we were a little surprised at the vibe and um and i just want to represent some of those things and get your feedback um we you know most of us came from a traditional background solving really really hard problems but usually in languages like java and c sharp and python and, and relational yeah. databases and all that stuff there's a lot of things happening now and what we found was there there are really two there are two sort of subcultures that are steering the message, and I think both of them are represented here. One of them is the, the sort of the hardline functional um, faction, and our, our um, basically functional programming is, was new to us, is new to us, is new to a lot of people. And it's not been our experience that the functional community knows how to relate to the poor object-oriented slobs that are coming in and don't know what an endofunctor is, you know? So, um, so the beards are very long and, 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 the, and, and we have sometimes have trouble keeping up. Then the other one, and this one was more concerning to me and, and a little bit disappointing, was I, it, it took some time, but I came to the conclusion uh, that I couldn't trust TypeSafe's technical guidance because it was sometimes confused with uh, their, their sort of marketing perspective. This is the conclusion that I've come to. I'm so sick of the word reactive. I, I shut down immediately if I see the word reactive because the reactive manifesto is loaded with prescription. And it's a, it's a, it's a, it basically says that we all have ACA deficit disorder. And if we just got ACA, we would be okay. Now, this is not the intent. I know that. I know this is not the intent. But this is where come message passing. I mean, message passing is a solution for a certain set of problems. I might not have those problems if I don't have a distributed computing problem, right? So the thing is that a company like TypeSafe, who I think is trying to, is a for-profit company, but is also trying to lead technically, I've personally, and a lot of people in my team, have shut down as far as listening to the technical side of the message because it's been blurred sometimes with marketing speak. And I have, I'm not going to name names, but I have, you know, emails with people at TypeSafe where it's become clear to me that those, that the marketing message and the technical guidance are conflated. And then I have, and then we have the, the, the functional side, which is really cool, but we were, we're a little slow on the uptake as far as endofunctors and things like that. So I think this is actually part of what it makes, makes it hard for people to join the Scala community. There's a little sense of we're a little better than the poor object-oriented slobs. Um, and then there's, there's also, uh, I mean, even like Brian, like I'll give you an example. To me, I was like, I, I couldn't believe it. We had this Northeast Scala thing. We have 200 seats. It sells out in five minutes. And people start saying, they thought it was fun. We should vote on who gets to attend. Like, I, I was so angry at that. I wanted to go to that conference. And people thought it was great. Like, we should vote on who gets to attend. Now, the fact that there are 200 slots is a different story. But the fact that some people thought it was a great idea, like, it's kind of a, a little bit of a closed and a factioned community. And we would like it to be a little warmer. And so this is our perspective. This has been the perspective of our company, which is a new entrant to the Scala community. So what, if anything, um, can be done, presuming that our perspective is at least a, a valid perspective. So let me, um, since Eric is, is champing at the bit here to jump in, <laughs> I'm just going to say one thing. I'll be happy to talk offline to anybody about the constraints uh, that, for instance, the Northeast Scholar Symposium operates under and why the philosophy means that it's hard for people to get in. Um, I, I will say that that has never been intended to be exclusionary. Um, it's mostly that, that we have tried to keep that as a community conference, and as such, we don't seek huge amounts of sponsorship um, and, and large attendance, because large, as soon as the conference gets to a certain size, the character changes, um, and we're fully aware that that tends to make it feel exclusionary. Um, but there are longtime members of the Scholar community who also yell at us because they couldn't get in, so uh, that's just sort of a, a, an accepted 
you know, downside of trying to keep it small. Um, that's a side issue to what you really asked, and Eric is dying to jump in here. So, <laughs> so I mean, I think the short answer is that you're right. You know, um, and I think that's like a. So I guess when I talk about type level as sort of aspiring to support a community of functional programmers, you know, I, I don't mean people who are already functional programmers who already think they know everything. I, I specifically mean you know support the development of a community of people who are interested in this and learning more. And I think that you know the community has not always done a good job of that. In fact, has often done you know sort of a poor job of that. And so right when you look at like say like the need for maybe like codes of conduct or the need for to like try and civilize discourse or be do more focus more on pedagogy education these things i mean i think that that specifically addressing your concerns is the focus of that you know and there's you know a lot of work being done similarly you know martin made a joke about haskellator right where you know some people just want to encode haskell and scala i think that's sort of a fair criticism in some ways i don't think that's what type level wants to do i mean i think we want to find the best way to do functional programming in scala and scala is an object functional hybrid language so that probably doesn't look the same as like standard ml or haskell or or something like that so I, I think your criticisms are totally real and we hear them and we're, you know, all I can really say is that, you know, there are, there are sort of enticements and barriers to functional programming and we're trying to remove the barriers. I mean, that doesn't, you know, making it enticing, you know, people being interested in coming, that's to some degree, you know, a function of their interest. But in terms of trying to make the community more welcoming, more approachable, these things, like, I take that very seriously and, you know, I think that those concerns are real and we're trying to, we're trying to improve that. So I think we'd be remiss as well if given the criticisms leveled a type safe message if we didn't let Jamie uh, actually pipe in here. Oh, great. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, Joe, I hear you. And uh, the thing about it that's really hard is that we're trying to reach a whole bunch of people at the same time, that we don't want to have this fall on deaf ears for the people who've been listening to it for a very long time. The crazy thing about Reactive is that, yeah, it is a marketing push. But it's not a type safe marketing push. It's a an, an expression of correctness in distributed systems. And I don't know, our view is that distributed systems don't even exist when you have multiple computers. They exist when you have multiple cores, right? Um, and we think everybody does. Uh, at the same time, you know, if there's an uh, you know, if, if there's an issue in like, for example, the services we're providing you then that's on me and I've got to figure out what that problem is and then we need to talk, seriously. Uh, and hopefully we can after my next talk because I got to give one. But, you know, I, I don't see reactive as a marketing push going away. Um, it's been too resonant. When a company like, you know, a really large consumer electronics producer in Cupertino comes to us and says, we need to be reactive because the word resonated with them in a single way to express all the things they need whenever they release a product and can't serve their customers, right? That's powerful, right? It, it, it sucks, I know, to have to hear this word all the time. Uh, but at the same time, there's, there's no other way to express it. And that encoding of the term has been, you know, it's taken on a life of its own. It's, yeah. So before, uh, before we jump to Alexi's question, um, I want to allow the other panelists to, to deal with this question simply because um, for what it's worth, even though I've been in the community a while, I'm where you are, right? I'm constantly trying to keep up with all the new stuff being pumped out by the community. Um, so I'm personally very sensitive to the idea that we don't do a very good job as a large community in conveying these ideas or making them more digestible. Um, and I, I have a suspicion that these two guys have some opinions on that matter as well. Um, yeah, so, um, so look, I'm up here as like an ex-Java guy, ex-Spring guy, ex-Hibernate guy, right? Um, I, don't, I don't come from a Haskell background, I don't come from an Idris background, or, or let alone an academic background. Um, and like I said earlier, I just kind of got involved in the functional community in Scala through what started as conveniences. It started as like silly syntax things. Um, and what I found is that we really, I, I felt built better software that, that you know, worked more reliably, um, it, it, it was faster to build, um, and we had much more confidence in our systems. So like, there's, there's a um, fabulous talk by like, Brett Victor uh, a couple years ago um, where he talks about like, finding your principle, and I decided a couple years ago that my principle is functional programming. Like, I really believe in the benefits that functional programming bring to system design. And whether that's like functional programming in the small, like working with nice collection libraries, or like functional programming large, as you do like large system design and the way systems interact, right? Um, 
And so, you know, just kind of echoing, like I completely agree with your um, observations of the communities. Um, you know, the lack of, of knowledge for, or the lack of um, material for, for uh, 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 bringing the OO folks kind of into the uh, FP world. Um, and I think that's like why I'm personally here is I want to address that situation. Um, you know, type level, like, you know, Eric alluded to this earlier, it started as like a kind of a collection of libraries that had a similar focus. And now I think if you described what type level is in one sentence, it would be really about building a supportive community. I mean, I don't want to speak for Eric, right? But, but building a supportive community for um, functional programming uh, in Scala. So anyway, I, I completely agree with your observations and I um, think that that's at least why I'm here is to address that. Brendan, you're up, man. So, you know, I, I, thinking about this, one of my worries is that I'm, I'm on the inner circle now. I mean, I've been involved in the Scala community since about 2009. Um, I found it very welcoming when I, came, when I started, but now I'm at the point where um, I speak at conferences. I, you know, I know a lot of the people involved in Scala. I know a lot of the people involved in type level, the people involved in ACA. Uh, so I, you know, I worry that I'm, you know, if I am sitting up here and trying to assuage your concerns that, you know, I am in a situation where it looks different from where I'm sitting. But I still see, you know, tons and tons of help and support. I mean, I still seek out support on a regular basis um, through IRC and Gitter and all of these other places. And I find that if you're, you know, if, if you ask the right questions and you, you're patient, that you get the answers you need, you get the support you need. I think there is a huge gap in documentation, and I will agree completely with that. One of the things that I'm trying to do this week is take this talk that I've been giving on Scholars Ed and turn it into a series of blog posts. because. I've come to the realization that you know there's a bunch of knowledge there that's useful to people that didn't exist when I learned these things. I figured these things out on my own, and they need to be broken down. So, you know, on one hand, you know, we can say that you know there are issues with the community. On the other hand, we're all members of the community, and it's our responsibility to improve that community. If you see something you don't like, then step up and help move it in the right direction. There's only so much that we can say. I don't like this before we have to take responsibility for helping to point people in the better direction. All right, and uh, Alexi, go ahead. I think we have time for one more question, unless this is really easy. Yes, so two very easy questions, short questions. So one is, uh, if we up this type level idea, do we need an open source Scala foundation separate from TypeSafe, where TypeSafe is one of the stakeholders, how we get there? And one question for Michael, how many Scala Z offsprings do we need, and how okay, does we were, it? We were actually trying to stay away from that one, but. Uh... <laughs> All right, so the first, the first question is, um, given, given the community, uh, the, the, the increased community presence and the presence of something like type level, do we actually need an open source foundation, uh, much the way uh, the Apache Software Foundation or something like that? Um, somebody want to jump in and address that? Somebody have an idea? I know Eric will if nobody uh, else will. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I don't, you know, it's interesting. I, I think that... Right, I think that type level, let's say the compiler for it, comes from sort of a little bit of that idea, but I don't necessarily think type level itself is the right, is like the right organization. But I, I mean, I would, I would totally support the existence of an organization like that and be interested in sort of, you know, either taking part or, or talking to someone in that role. So I think that, broadly speaking, I mean, it's always challenging to get people to participate in bureaucracy, and I'm not saying that anyone should just for the hell of it, but if, if a lot of people feel that way, I mean, I think it'd be interesting to talk about, basically. Um, so I think, broadly speaking, I agree. Yeah, I think there's consensus on that. So the second one is the question we've all been trying to avoid because it's so contentious, which is the the cats versus Scala's Ed versus how many different variants of this thing do we need uh, question. So um, rather than focus on the contentious part of that, um, I, I'm going to let Michael jump in here with a technical uh, viewpoint on that one. Yes, yeah, uh, sure. So uh, you know what, what Alexi is referring to is that I have a library called Structures. Um, it defines things like uh, the functor monad applicative type class. Um, I'm also an active contributor to cats, um, and where we also have like functor monad and applicative. Um, so like you know, structures personally for me was in or is in a, uh, an exploration of what's possible um, in Scala that's kind of closely aligned with the standard library. Um, it's not going to provide like alternatives to standard library uh, abstractions. So for example, it's going to have uh, you know, close integration with, um, you know, the standard collections library, for instance. You, you won't ever see structures define its own option type, right, um, or its own list type. Um, and there are times that, that those abstractions are absolutely meaningful and, and should exist. Um, so anyway, I'm not really sure, like, you know, I, I think, you know, Eric and I talked when we first, or when I first um, started structures, um, and I, I have this on the, on the GitHub page about it, that, like, 
we think there's a um, space in the design space or, or room in the design space for both libraries right now. Um, I don't know if I would ever recommend someone to use structures in production. I think structures, at least at where it is today, is more of a place to learn about functional concepts. Um, and that like, if you really have a big system that, that you know, needs production level support, um, you know, I would look at uh, other libraries, um, hopefully CAT soon. Um, you know, CATs, we, we, we don't have any published releases yet, only, only snapshots. So not today, but, <laughs> but in the future, I think um, you know, hopefully CATs is that library. But uh, yeah. And I think that means we're, we're out of time. So I want to thank everybody for showing up, and um, bear in mind that everybody up here is approachable. So if your question did not get, uh, you did not get a chance to ask a question, um, find any one of these easily recognizable people um, and ask, you know, in private. Um, and thanks very much for your attention.